Shields up, Ironbreakers. Welcome back to Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. We've been playing this game over the last couple of days, pretty much since the game released in early access on the PlayStation side of things. And I feel like I finally have a firm grasp as to how I feel about it. I've been seeing a lot of people ask me in the live streams, Rurikon, do you recommend this game? How do you feel about the game? Tell me your opinion on it and all of that stuff. And that is what this video is going to be about. Now at this point I have finished the main campaign of the game, which very much like the developers said, lasted for about 20 hours, but there's plenty of more content to be experienced. Last night I actually started my endgame progression, if you guys want to check out that stream it is available on the channel, I was actually playing with uh, two friends, Warangashi and Mr. Tummy Giggles, which you guys might have seen in our streams, and we were just blasting through the game. So I have a lot of things to talk about when it comes to this, including my main complaints and all of that, but as per usual, we should start at the very beginning because I know that a lot of people are going to be watching this video and going to be like, hey, Rurikon, what exactly is this game all about? Because I've seen a lot of people trying to compare this to something like Tales of Arise, and even though you look at the art style and it seems kind of similar, this game does not play like Tales of Arise at all, in my personal opinion, but, you know, I've seen some people say, oh, the combat kind of looks like it. I don't think so. I don't really see it that way, I've played the entirety of Tales of Arise, greatly enjoyed that game, but this is fundamentally a very different game. Now, anyways, so let's get started. This is not a JRPG, this is an action RPG. You're going to be taking on missions, and you're going to be going through those missions. There's going to be these scenarios like the one that you are watching in the background, which, by the way, this was one of my favorite missions, and this does not include any particular spoilers or anything like that, at least in my opinion. So, But it was a cool mission because it showcases a lot of different elements, like shooting with the turrets and walking around, blasting people. Uh, you know, destroying people in your deck, boarding other ships. It was a really nice mission, a really good uh, starting point, because this is at the very beginning of the game. See, because the game just keeps giving you these really cool scenarios in the campaign, and it just keeps amping them up over and over and over. There was only one point during the main campaign where I was like, ah, this is kind of a little bit of filler, because there's like this little section when you get to a specific town where it's, oh, let's just go ahead and have you do a bunch of fetch quests. But that only happens like once throughout the whole game. The rest of the game is fairly straightforward. And here I'm going through the, a couple of options. I was trying to sort out the aim sensitivity because it was a little bit too sensitive. But anyway, so it is an action RPG. You're going to be playing through the game with different characters. You can see me here. I'm playing with Percival, who isn't even one of the main cast. This is one of the characters that you get to unlock as you get crewmate tickets and stuff like that. And these different characters are going to provide you with different playstyles. So to give you a couple of examples here, the main character, which is called Gran, or in my case, you can see on the top left-hand side, I actually call them Rurikon, because that is like the representation of the player character. That character is kind of an all-rounder. You can play him as a DPS or as a support. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that he can do. He can heal, he can provide buffs, do all of these things. Then you have like another character called Vayne, uh, which is kind of like a tank. He plays really just like a tank. He grabs aggro. He has an invincibility shield that he can use to protect the party. Uh, if you look at Percival, which is the one that we are uh, using here, he's kind of like a damage dealing machine basically he just does a ton of damage inflicts fire debuff upon enemies which causes them to take damage over time and then you also have uh Eugen, who is also in the party i know that if you read the name it says eugene almost but the pronunciation of his name in this game is actually Eugen, so that's the way that i'm going to be referring to him he's just the range damage powerhouse and he's actually the main character that i've played uh in the game even though Throughout the campaign, I opted for playing characters that were not as optimal because the game quite simply wasn't that challenging, and we'll talk more about that a little bit further in the video. But just know that Eugen is an absolute beast. But the idea here is, depending on the character that you choose, you're going to have different playstyles, almost like a Monster Hunter weapon. So you choose, you know, your sword and shield, you choose your charge blade. That is going to change up how you approach each scenario in the game. But don't think of it as being as complex or having as much depth as a Monster Hunter weapon. These characters are a little bit more similar, and I will talk a little bit more about that. Now, one of the questions that a lot of people were asking me is, is the game open world? No. 
This game utilizes a mission structure, somewhat similar to the structure of Monster Hunter, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. So you go on missions and, you know, the missions, if you're in the main campaign, are going to be these large elaborate levels, which have like specific things that you need to do in the level. But the idea is you go through a mission, kill a bunch of dudes, and usually there's a big boss fight at the end when it comes to the campaign. But then there's also multiplayer missions, which are much more like jump into this arena, kill a bunch of dudes or jump into this arena, kill this boss fight, but it's usually more around an arena. Now, there are some missions that involve a little bit of a larger area, but fundamentally, most of the multiplayer missions that I've done so far have been much more arena-type situations where you just go in there and it's kind of like a raid encounter, right? So it is not an open world, it is a mission structure. Now, there's also two types of things that you're going to be doing in the game at the very beginning, which is one of them is the main campaign. Main campaign is only single player. There's no co-op in the main campaign. Or you can go and you can take on multiplayer missions, which are, like I said, these arena type missions. So those are very different. And one of the really cool things about the game is that whenever you are doing boss fights, they work almost like MMORPG raids. So you get the telegraphs, which tell you, oh, the thing is going to hit here. You got to dodge it. You got to read mechanics. You got to see what the boss is doing. Then the bosses themselves will have specific mechanics like overdrive, which means, oh, you can't really do, uh, you're going to deal less damage. The boss is going to be a lot tankier. Uh, and then they also have bloodlust, which means you can't use your skybound darts, which is kind of like your ultimate ability. So they have mechanics and phases that they go through. And particularly in the main bosses, like in the campaign, and even just like major significant bosses, they will also have distinct phases where they power up and all of that, but they are extremely enjoyable fights. I greatly had a ton of fun. But now that you have a basic understanding of what the game is all about, and there's plenty of gameplay in the channel, so you choose to want to watch more, you can check that out. Let's talk about the visuals. So I only got to play on the PlayStation 5. I have heard from people that have played on the PC that on the PC side of things, everything is running smooth, but I haven't gotten to test that myself. And also we don't know, you know, PCs, different hardware setups and all that stuff. Your mileage may vary, but my early indications from people that I know that are playing the game on PC, everything seems to be running smoothly. No real issues there. Now, on the PlayStation side of things, uh, one of the things that was disappointing to me and that I already mentioned in a previous video was the fact that, you know, performance mode is only 1080p. This is not a deal breaker. I don't really care. One of, I don't even think that the, um, you know, the upscaling of resolution in this game does a massive difference. Uh, although you can play the game at 4K 30fps if you choose to. But personally, I'm always going to take frames. If it's 1080p 60fps, I'll take 1080p 60fps. That's all good for me. Thank you very much. So, you know, that is one of the things that I was a little bit, uh, I wish it was 1440p. I think it would have been better, but it's not the end of the, the, uh, the, end of the world. Now, uh, besides that, when it comes to animations, I think that the animations of the game are absolutely gorgeous. You've been seeing some of those in here. For pretty much every character that I've played, I've always enjoyed the animations. They feel impactful. They feel... Uh, they feel good, which is one of the things that I feel doesn't really translate as well to YouTube because I remember specifically when I was watching the trailer where they were showcasing Eugen, who is the, the gunner, and his shots didn't feel very impactful in the trailer, but as I've played Eugen, I was like, nah, bro, these shots are great. His grenade tosses are awesome. It just feels good to play. I think that every single character that I've played felt good to play even if that character wasn't my playstyle. like an example would be Vasaraga who's this big dude with a scythe and he's all about big charged attacks so his playstyle is not really my style because I don't really play greatsword all that much right but greatsword mains are probably going to love Vasaraga because he, even though he uses a scythe he's all about those big charged attacks that just shred everything so you know these different playstyles. You're going to enjoy them most likely in all the characters I played. I like them. And the animations on every character have felt very solid. Whether that is Skybound Arts or uh, whether that is their j just their regular attacks. Whether it is their skill shots. All of that stuff feels good. So from a visual standpoint, the game is a visual spectacle. And it just feels very nice and responsive as you are playing. So no real complaints there. In terms of cutscenes, the cutscenes of the game are also really good. The ones from the main campaign, because multiplayer missions don't really have that many cutscenes, obviously. 
Uh, however, I would also like to make a quick distinction here that there's two types of cutscenes. Some of those are going to be the cutscenes wherein the characters are just talking, and those are a little bit more static and not as dynamic. But whenever there, there's a major cutscene, it's much better animated and all that stuff. So just keep that in mind. But visually, no real complaints besides the fact that, you know, I wish it was 1440p for performance, but they went with 1080p. And at the end of the day, I also think that if you can't ensure that you're going to get solid 60 at 1440p, you might as well go 1080p. Because a game like this, I feel like you really want to be playing it at 60 because it just feels way more responsive. I mean, I usually just like that regardless of whatever game it is. I prefer 60 FPS. But in, the, in a game like this, an action RPG that has this level of action and this level of uh, reaction timing that you need to have and whatnot, 60 FPS is definitely the way to go. Now, let's talk a little bit about the sound. I feel like the sound of the characters hitting stuff, you know, shooting, impacts, all of these, super solid. Not a whole lot to, to add there. I feel like they're really good. Now, a really, a really cool aspect that surprised me a lot was the voice acting. I'm talking about the English voice acting. I haven't really tested out the Japanese because I usually, when it comes to these games and I'm streaming them, I always go for the English version because it's easier for people to follow along on a stream. Uh, but the English voice acting is actually really good above what I would expect for, uh, you know, one of these Japanese games, particularly because I haven't really seen the previous output of Psy games. I know that they put out a fighter. I don't really play a lot of fighting games, but there's like uh, Grand Blue Fantasy Rising, which is the, the fighter game, right? And I felt like the voice acting in this and Relink was way above what I expected. You know, those are just my thoughts on it. Feel free to disagree if you guys have, if you've played the game and if you've heard voices of the game and you're like oh this doesn't actually feel that great i thought it was awesome they even have like some uh, well-known voice actors one of the ones that i'm familiar with is uh the actor that plays eugen which is the main character that i play who is richard apcar uh he also played gaius baltar in um gaius van balesar not baltar <laughs> gaius van balesar on Final Fantasy 14, and you know, he just does an excellent job there. He also plays the Admiral in Monster Hunter World, so might be familiar for you guys. But yeah, I think that the voice acting is above what I would expect. Uh, that's one of the things. Now, the other thing that I would like to call your attention to is actually the soundtrack. So you've been listening to one of the soundtracks in the background here. I'm gonna pause that. And I'm going to show you uh, one of the tracks here, which is for one of the boss fights. Even though the person who extracted the tracks from the game, this channel, Murchie Blafu, I think that the audio mixing is not the best. It still gives you a good idea of what to expect from the track. Just know that in the game, the track is much more impactful, I feel like, because the mixing is better in game. But this is just to give you an idea. So in here you have like a much, you know, a, usually a more traditional soundtrack for these kinds of games. Sounds really good. Really like it. Like I really enjoyed the soundtrack. But the cool thing is that they take the soundtrack to places where you don't really expect. So this is a boss fight and here's the where it sounds like. I'm just going to show you this one and when it, when it comes to boss fights. Well, I'll show you one more just a, a little bit to give you guys an idea of just the range where they go through. But like listen to this which is after the boss's face transition. Like, I've heard from people that the Grand Blue Fantasy mobile game has absolutely outstanding OST, but I never really got to experience that because I don't really play gotcha games, mobile games, all of that stuff, right? So this is the first time that I've been exposed to the uh, soundtrack of Grand Blue Fantasy and is absolutely phenomenal, in my opinion. Like, here's just one more track. To, to, again, to give you guys an idea of the range, this is another boss fight. I'm going to put it up ahead a little bit. So, like, 
basically the point that I'm trying to make is soundtrack absolutely excellent. I love that I thought it was one of the highlights of the game itself. I, th I do think that the soundtrack is absolutely phenomenal. So just wanted to point that out there. It was definitely a highlight of it. Now, let's talk very briefly about the story. I'm not going to be giving you guys any, you know, spoilers or anything like that. I feel like the overall plot of the story is all right. It's not really the best story I've ever seen. Uh, I would have wanted something a little bit better when it comes to the story. But at the end of the day, that's not to say the story is bad by any means. It is your standard anime power friendship type of story so if you guys have seen those types of stories you'll know exactly what i'm talking about but the cool thing is the spectacle that happens in between the story moments in my opinion that is where the game really shines there are some story moments that i was like oh that was cool that thing happened that was nice but overall i don't think that this is gonna blow anybody's minds away okay is what i'm getting at but it's all right um now, let's talk briefly about the gameplay. You guys have already seen a bunch of gameplay. I've talked a lot about the gameplay. We've streamed the gameplay. I think the gameplay is absolutely phenomenal. It is silky smooth. I love playing the game. I'm going to continue playing the game for a significant chunk of time. I'm, I really, really like going through the different characters, even though right now I'm focusing mostly on Eugen because of the way that the progression works and all of that stuff. But gameplay feels very responsive. It is action combat. The boss fights feel very immersive. It is super fun to play. There are a couple of boss fights where things struggle a little bit, like they commit the cardinal sin of having a boss fight that gives you red telegraphs with mostly a red backdrop. This seems somewhat familiar as someone who played Final Fantasy XIV. I think it was a P3S, Phoenix. And it was just like, oh, everything is orange on orange on orange on orange. It's like kind of hard to see a red telegraph in a lava area that's filled with red stuff. Okay. We, we need these telegraphs to maybe be a little bit, you know, more discernible from the, the rest of the thing. But other than that, on a couple of bosses, it's not really a big deal. Right. So the boss fights, boss fights are very fun. The combat against minions is also very fun. The game itself is extremely fun all around so loved gameplay good stuff there's tons of progression to be had for each character so you can craft weapons these weapons can be upgraded they can be limit broken they generate their own mastery uh skill tree i've talked about this in previous games the mastery skill tree in this game for each character is absolutely massive however this is both a good thing and a bad thing because like i mentioned these characters don't feel nearly as complex in terms of their moveset as say a monster hunter weapon which means that a lot of the mastery of these characters actually comes from, you know, the progression of their mastery tree, the skills that you choose to use with the character, as well as upgrading their weapons and all that stuff. And that is kind of like what dictates the character power more so than your technical prowess with the character. Now, don't get me wrong. It is going to be important for you to know how to play your character, because if you don't know, you're not going to be very efficient with it. But fundamentally, knowing how to play a character kind of revolves more around learning each character's gimmicks, which I'll talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, from terms of gameplay, tons of fun, tons of combat, action combat, super cool. You got perfect dodges, perfect parries. You got skills that act in ways like dodges. You have skills that give you invincibility, skills that give you heals. You actually even have roles that you can kind of give to each of the characters based around their skill set. Like I said, you can build a Gran, who is the main character. You can build him up as uh, a buffer, a healer, damage dealer, uh, a mix in between, you know, other characters will have more specific roles, more about damage. But like Vasaraga, for instance, you can build him as a damage dealer or as a tank. You know, each character is going to have certain roles that they can fill within your party. There isn't a holy trinity per se, but you can kind of make a party around having a tank and a healer and damage dealers if that is something that you like. And there is going to be a lot of optimizing your party as you are playing through the campaign because you don't just want to power through on your main character. I mean, you can do that, but I think it's more fun if your other characters are contributing as well. So you want to like min-max each individual character, form your perfect party, and go through the campaign with that. And fundamentally, the fights are an absolute spectacle when it comes to this game. They're just tremendously fun, super cool. Love it. So now, 
let's get into the complaint section because I do have some complaints. Now, the very first complaint that I have, I'm going to bring up a, a video here. This is from my playthrough of the game. And the very first complaint that I need to, I need to, it's just made me a little bit sad. The game is too easy, way too easy. So to give you an idea right here in this video, notice the level of the enemies we are fighting. In case you can't really tell very well, these enemies we're fighting right here are level 43. So from the point at which you're at in the game, I quickly deduced you're not supposed to be fighting these enemies. Now, if you guys are wondering which difficulty I played in, I played on hard, which is the maximum difficulty you can have when you start playing the game. Uh, so I was playing the campaign on hard. The hard difficulty only affects the campaign. The missions themselves have individual difficulty. So the multiplayer missions, stuff like that, they have their own individual difficulty. But, you know, I was playing the campaign on hard. These enemies are level 43. My party is my main character's level 20. The secondary character's level 20. And then there's a level 18 character and level 17 character. Which, by the way, the level 18 and 17, I had just swapped them in. So they're not properly optimized. The only character that is actually min max to any extent is the character that i'm playing oigan and even then he's level 20 the boss that i'm fighting right now is level 48 you'll notice that i'm not really dealing that much damage i killed this boss and this is exactly what i'm talking about when i'm saying that i don't think that the difficulty is appropriate for the game and this is one of those situations where you know how people always say, oh, Rurikon, why does it affect you if a developer chooses to add an easy mode? This is why. Because a lot of times when developers have to focus on easy modes and, you know, on having multiple difficulties in a video game, usually this is what ends up happening. They don't have enough time or they don't put in enough effort. I, I, I don't know why. But fundamentally, the harder difficulties just become too easy, which, as you can see, even though it's going to take me a while to kill him, because the boss just has a tremendous amount of HP, you're not supposed to fight this boss at this point, I'm still going to kill him. And this was the only point in the game where I almost lost. So that's whenever, because I've, I've been criticizing the difficulty of the game throughout my streams, so I want people to really understand. This was literally the only moment in the story where I almost lost. And the reason that happened is because I decided to fight a boss that was 30 levels above me. And the only reason I almost lost, by the way, is because the, the NPCs in my party kept dying. And so if you if they die enough times, eventually there there's this critical gauge that shows up whenever people die. And as that gauge diminishes, eventually if you run out of critical gauge, that's a game over. But that gauge is way too forgiving. It's just way too forgiving. We need some type of harder mechanic to guarantee fail systems. Maybe even have the critical gauge deplete faster when you're playing in hard mode. I don't know. But I definitely feel like the team needs to do something. Now, I did, I'm not going to be pulling up every instances where I felt that, like the game was super easy. Uh, I will be pulling up one more in just a second here. But another instance happened where I was fighting a boss. And I had this... I was trying out Vasaraga for the first time, which is a character in the game. And I completely messed up the... Um, the sigil system because there's a sigil system that works almost like the armor in monster Hunter gives you skills i didn't put any sigils into vasaraga so it was super weak and i was just getting my ass kicked by this boss i was just dying repeatedly like i spent the majority of the boss fight just dying so my player character didn't do anything but i had been like i told you i had been min maxing my party so my character was actually the weakest at that point because i had just unlocked vasaraga the party just killed the boss without my help at all the NPC party, the AI party, just killed the boss because I had min-maxed them to be very efficient. They just shredded through the boss. And I, it wasn't even challenging. It didn't even seem like, you know, the, the boss took longer because I was dying. It was probably just going to be way, way faster if I was just killing it normally. And I was just like, wow, okay, this is kind of dumb. Because this was a boss that was actually in one of the final dungeons of the game. Actually, I think it was the final dungeon in the game. And I was just dying the whole time, and we still killed the boss. Super easy. So, that's what I'm saying, and I do feel like that is a problem. And I know that a lot of people are going to say, well, Rurikon, the game has a lot more harder challenges up ahead. And yes, I, I understand, because there will be, there's uh, this 
difficulty that you keep unlocking when you get to the end game. Because once you get to the end game, things work very much like Monster Hunter in terms of structure, which is to say they're going to give you a couple of key quests. When you complete those key quests, they unlock a new tier of difficulty. And currently, uh, me and my friends, because we were playing last night, we went up to very hard and we were still killing stuff super fast. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you guys an example uh, a little bit further ahead in the video. But the point that I'm making is even if eventually a couple of more hours from now, I get to a point where it's like, okay, now I'm finally getting challenged. That doesn't change that for like the first 30 hours or so of the game, it is too easy. It's just too easy. And, you know, even if after 30 hours, okay, after 30 hours, now you're finally getting challenged. I'm just like, okay, but there's been 30 hours where the game is just super easy and there's not a whole lot that I can do to make it more challenging besides gimping myself. Like, oh, I could remove the NPCs from the party and play solo. But most of the mechanics in this game revolve around you playing around your NPCs with link attacks and chain bursts and all of that stuff. And it just feels weird. Like, why would you remove some of these mechanics just in order to be able to be challenged? So again, I want to make sure that people understand. Super easy. Probably there will be stuff that's going to be much, much harder near the end of the game, but I wanted to have some of that stuff earlier in the game. And I'm not even that amazing at action games to begin with, so keep that in mind. I'm not saying this as a, ooh, weird, uh, weird brag or whatever. No, that's not the weird flex. That's not the point. I'm just making it clear to everybody that's playing. But anyways, that's enough of me uh, talking about the difficulty. I will bring it up just one more time, but yeah. So another thing is you have no control over the other characters' actions when you're playing with NPCs. You have one thing that you can do where, where basically you can tell them, don't use your Skybound Arts unless I use mine so that you can guarantee a chain burst with your character. But other than that, you can't really tell them when to use their skills, uh, when to position for... You can't really control them at all. You can't even swap between characters, which is one of the things that a lot of people were asking me, oh, can you swap between characters? No. You can swap between them when you're not in combat. When you are in combat, you're locked into the character that you are currently playing. And there's a lot of games that let you swap between characters. That's not even something that I personally care that much about. But I do know that a lot of people like swapping between characters and that that would be a, a feature that they would appreciate in this. So just be aware. Currently, you can't do it. I don't know if that's something that they can patch in. I feel like it should be easy because all the characters have... Uh, programmable move sets so it should be fairly easy for you to just swap between them but you know if you're going to be even more efficient than what you already are that's just gonna <laughs> that's just gonna completely break the game even more they need to make it way harder in order to be able to give you more control but one of the things that i would like is to be able to assign at least one skill from uh each character to like a button press somewhere so that i would be able to tell like hey catalina pop your heel or hey vane drop your shield like, that would be very useful in order to have more control over the characters, even if we don't get direct control of the characters. But that's not something that you can do right now. Another thing that is a complaint that's not related to gameplay, it's just a regular complaint that I have, would be the, the side characters. And I say side characters, they're main characters in the Grand Blue universe, I would imagine, because, you know... The, the Grand Blue game is all about gacha, so characters are one of the most important things. But they do have a set of main characters for the game, which if I'm not mistaken, it's Eugen, Gran, Eo, Catalina, Rosetta, and Rackham. I think those are the main characters of the game. So all of the other characters, you are expected to unlock them with crewmate tickets. Now, getting crewmate tickets is super easy. You just play through the game. You're going to be able to unlock characters at a fairly reasonable pace. Let's just say you're... You're not going to unlock everything by the 30 hour mark, but you're going to unlock pretty much most characters that you care for. And then you can unlock the other ones by just continuing to progress through the game as far as I can understand. But the problem that I have is that I wish that the, the characters that you unlock would be organically included in the story. They aren't. So for instance, I like Percival. I wanted to unlock Percival. It was the first character I unlocked. So I unlocked Percival, and I was expecting, oh, maybe there will be like a little story bit that I do to get Percival. No. Nope. Here's Percival. Here you go. He's unlocked now. He's part of your team. And I was like, okay. So there's no real story reason for him to be with the team. It's just, hey, you now have this character. As a matter of fact, in most of the main cutscenes, those characters aren't even featured. So say if you're playing through the whole game as Percival, and then you get to a major cutscene, he's just not there. 
the main roster are the only ones who are there. Like I said, Oigan, uh, Gran, Rosetta, Rackham, Catalina, EO. Those are the characters that are going to be there. The other characters, they're just there to add flavor to the gameplay. Not a huge deal, but I think it would have been nice to, you know, introduce them to the story that way. Now, I do know that there are fate uh, chapters. I couldn't do those on stream because it's mostly just, you know, reading through text. Not even reading. They, they voice act the text, but it's just like static background text playing through. And, you know, that's just not something that people that tune in for an action RPG want to sit there and, and watch. So I, I do plan on watching those in my own time. But they basically give more background information on the characters. But they I don't think they still give you a reason as to why these characters have joined our party. You know? Which would have been a nice thing to do, but not a really a big uh, a big deal. Um, another thing, I think I've already mentioned most of the things. Uh, characters are more about progression than technical execution. Master tree weapon upgrades and skills. I mentioned this briefly already in the video. Uh, so, for instance, when it comes to these characters... It's all about mastering the gimmick of the character itself. So if you notice, I'm playing Oigan right now, and his gimmick is he goes into the sniper mode that you kind of just like throw grenades and shoot. And the whole point is throw three grenades, shoot, detonate the grenades. Go into sniper mode, throw three grenades, shoot, detonate the grenades. That's kind of the gimmick of this character. Now every now and then you interrupt it to pop off a skill, but every character has a gimmick like this. And I think it would have been nice if there was just a little bit more complexity to it. Like maybe have two gimmicks instead of one, like maybe force me to do something to reload my weapon because this weapon literally has no reloads. It just shoots forever. It's kind of like the grenades work like the reload. But, you know, very much like Oigan, you guys might be, okay, so Oigan's a super simple character. What about the other characters? Well, you we have Percival, which is uh, the character that we were playing uh, earlier in the video. And that character is all about doing skills and following up the skills with charged attacks. Then you have uh, Rackham, who is another gun character. He's all about timing your shots and then after you do the timing of the shots you do a charge shot you look at Graham; he's all about finishing combos and doing a charge attack each character has some very simple mechanic like this and i wish there was a little bit more depth to them but you know for their first entry into the action rpg genre i actually think they've done a fantastic job again just wish it was a little bit more challenging now i know that people are going to bring up oh but the multiplayer is where the challenge is really going to come in. This is the hardest boss that we fought so far. And when I say the hardest boss, it's like this was one of the harder bosses that was available in the quest counter after I finished the game and progressed into the very hard difficulty. And I just want you guys to look at how quickly me and my friends just obliterate this thing. So he's like this big mech, very dangerous. Now, we did fail to do S++ because uh, they died twice. But like... Look at the boss's health, right? I'm just setting up my, my damage coming in. Boom. He's already at 98, 97. It goes by super fast. And this was actually one of the tankier ones. If you actually look at the levels that we have here, the only level appropriate uh, character is Mr. Tummy Giggles over here with Narmaya. He's level 73. The boss is level 75. I'm level 66, and Wada Nagashiks is level 62. So we are pretty much 10 levels below the boss, and we are just still shredding through him. It's, it's not really a challenge at all. And this was like, again, one of the harder bosses that we fought so far. But it's still too easy. Now, I understand that as we progress, things will get harder, but I feel like for the initial 30 hours of gameplay, they should be harder for players that are, you know, actually really into action RPGs and want to be challenged. But anyways, again, that's my biggest complaint. I still really like the game. I'm going to keep playing the game. I think the game's a ton of fun. People asking me, Rurikon, is the game worth it? Uh, right now, I'm 30 hours in. I believe there's plenty of more content to be had. So in my opinion, yes, the game is worth it, particularly if you have friends to play with. Because I feel like the end game is going to be a ton more fun if you're playing with friends. Although, you can play the whole thing solo. But I do think it's going to slow you down. Because you're going to be required to level up your whole party as opposed to just your one character. And Mastery Tree greatly expands at the end. Like, I've been playing a ton with Oigan. And his Mastery Tree, I'm only at like 60%, I think. And there's still even more to unlock as I progress into the higher difficulties. So I think that near the end, this is definitely going to be something that you want to play in multiplayer, in my opinion. 
But anyway, that's going to be it for now. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe, bell notification icon, all of that jazz. These are my thoughts on uh, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink so far. I'll be sure to update it as we progress through the game. And we're going to be streaming the game naturally more and more here in the channel throughout the month. So yeah, hopefully you'll look forward to that. Subscribe, bell notification, like button, all the usual YouTube stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Stay strong, stay safe. Peace out.